We made it. Yeah. Yay! For everybody that woke up early, thank you very much for coming. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, the whole crew, everybody came in together. Uh, you know, where people probably wake up since 2 o'clock in the morning to get food prepared for the ones that were going to the room service, was on call. Yeah. Uh, get to make food. Of course, we, we just sleep until late and just go out without the audience and go out, so you know, we, are, we are the lazy bunks. <laughs> I just wanted to go briefly uh, to some of the stops we've done. I had several questions regarding uh, if, we, if you uh, would receive something or you could find some place where we have been actually in the trip since we have been we already don't give you an itinerary and then we change it all. So <laughs> we change it every day and one time to another. So what I will do right now is just show the map with the stops and the sequence we've done. And if you like to see this in more detail, those white iPads have access to the yellow brick tracker site for Seaborne uh, the expeditions. And there you'll find the names and you'll see the actual track of the ship. So that's something that you can do a, 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 a print at home or you can uh, copy the names if you like. I mean, you can just print the whole thing as a scrapbook and use those, that information. There are some pictures there that will be taken for the staff. So it's a good resource. Then uh, if you have that address, even when you get back home, you can use that as a resource. And it will show you also uh, the future trip so you'll know that yours was the best of the whole season. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let's go to the map. Uh, if we can have the lights down here, this will require a little bit more darkness. And uh, here we have, of course, our general map, South America, Drake Passage, Antarctic Peninsula. The Antarctic Peninsula, and we started our first change of schedule going to Yankee Harbor. So these are the South Shetland Islands. Uh, we came here through the uh, Nelson Strait, and we stopped in Yankee Harbor. Before that, we did a cruise to the northern side around these areas, but our first stop was Yankee Harbor here on the south. This block is not written only for the days we are in Antarctica. It's written for every single day of the trip. So if you don't remember what you did in Montevideo, uh, it will be there as well, because all the staff went to check the quality of the meat at the market in Montevideo. It's really bad. As we were going south, uh, we passed in a group of islands. Uh, there was, the weather was not good. We didn't find any shelter. And then we went into Paradise Bay. And then the sun shined out for us. We had the typical four season days where we had rain, we had sun, we had wind, and then we have more uh, snow again. So the whole four seasons happened as we cruised with our zodiacs in Paradise Bay. So here we saw our first and two penguins. Here we had an experience with ice. We saw a few penguins on the ice. We saw some of our first glaciers. Then we went and cruised through the Neumeyer Channel. So on the island here, Anvers, we went south. We were trying to get around to the other side, to our next destination. We had to turn around because of the ice, and we went out to the place called Damoy Point. This is when we went. The first group went out, just tramped into the ice to make sure everybody else had a good time visiting a shore. So group one sacrificed themselves in pro of the rest of the ship. We continued, and uh, that day we proposed Waterboard Point as our continental landing, merging two penguins, souvenir shopping, yay! And the stamp and the passport, so that was a chance. Uh, we we uh, arrived early morning, and the ice looked like it was clogged. The captain tried to come from the northern side. He couldn't come from that side. There was too much bigger iceberg, so we turned around and tried again from the south. And after looking back and forth, we finally made it to Waterboard, and we were able to operate. And that was the first day that you probably saw quite a number of ships but coming back and forth, uh, sh uh, showing you that this is a very active place in terms of visit. Overnight from uh, Paradise Bay, we cruised the whole Gerlache Strait. We went into the Bransfield Strait, and early in the morning, we arrived to Hope Bay. We were expecting to find some ice along the Bransfield, but it was very clear, so the bridge team just steamed the ship as much as they could, and we got to Hope Bay very early in the morning, and then we saw the Adeli penguins and the tabular icebergs in the afternoon when the captain took us for cruising near these beautiful icebergs on the north. And then we crossed here from the Antarctic Sound over to Half Moon Island, just across from Yankee Harbor, so we're very close to the point where we started, uh, where we saw 
uh, the uh, chin strap penguin. So we had scored the three species we were aiming to see, and we have done quite a variety of places showing you uh, some of the best places in terms of scenic, like Hope Bay and Paradise Bay in the Newmeyer Channel. Now we went out, we saw those magnificent fin whales as we were sailing, and then now we crossed already the Nelson Strait, and we are basically in the Drake Passage as it is now. Mr. Drake seems to be quite friendly so far. Let's keep our finger crossed so that continues like that. So from the Antarctic Peninsula, we're going to go to the Drake, towards South America. We will pass the 60 degrees south, then we'll be out of Antarctica, the political boundary of Antarctica. We will pass the convergence when we will leave the biological realm of Antarctica, and then we're going to be heading over towards the Beagle Channel in the southern side of the continent. Of course, the captain will keep you updated with any plans in regards to what's happening as we go closer to the continent. Ladies and gentlemen, I wanted to show you something uh, for you to have an idea of what we have to organize in terms of um, chief movements. This is a site uh, that is only accessible to the ship uh, where it shows the movement of all ships. These are all the ships that are in the area at six o'clock in the afternoon today. This is yeah. us as we are leaving towards to King George, the Silver Explorer, there was here, two ships coming down, one ship here in the Elephant Island, one ship around Deception Island, one, two, three, four, five, six. We were very fortunate that there were only three ships down there because that gave, we, uh, gave us options to go to different places. And right now here, there are two ships operating in the Antarctic Sound. At the height of the season can be as many as 30 ships operating in the whole peninsula but they're not all at the same time at the same place. Some are in the ports when they turn around, some are crossing the Drake Passage, and some are down here. So we're kind of spread it out. If we are lucky, we are in a week, there are no other ships. If we are unlucky, well, everybody is there, and if the weather turns bad, we all play musical chairs. The first one to sit, get the place. So it's gonna be very fast. Activity for tomorrow, sleep in. These are the group orders of your family. So green, you get to sleep later. I don't know if there is a branch option available, but uh, yes. <coughs> Weather, this is for pure entertainment, all right? Don't take this, uh, just take it for base value. This is a site called Passage Weather. Uh, here we have the date, here we have the time in UTC, Universal Time, it's basically Greenwich. And then on the graphic, we have latitudes and we have longitudes. The colors represent how strong the winds are, the little arrows represent the direction of the wind, and then the little legs represents the speed of the wind. Short leg represent five knots, long leg represent 10 knots. So here, for example, you see 25 knots. And this will be the movement of this front as we go to the Drake Passage, starting tonight at around midnight. So here we go, six o'clock, uh, three o'clock in the morning, and this passage is coming through. So you see it's quite gentle, uh, near the, the South Shetland Islands, 15, 20 knots. It will change a bit, but basically we don't have any of this red stuff that we had on the Falkland Islands when we were coming south. So our passage to the Drake, yeah, don't, don't quote me on that. <laughs> we will start shaking, and the captain says, secure your belongings. <laughs> you know what's coming up. So this is uh, the wind for our passage. Hopefully we make it to Shwaya uh, with some nice weather and we can enjoy uh, our time out there. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is kind of the less opportunity that I have the microphone to address you as a group. And uh, I'd like to leave you with, a, 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 it's not exactly a poem, it's a short uh, quotation from a very uh, famous author from uh, Uruguay. His name is uh, Eduardo Galeano. Uh, he was a political activist uh, in the times of the military um, dictatorships in South America. That's very famous, wrote several, several beautiful poems and, uh, and prose. And it is something that I think relates very well to how I feel about what we, as expedition staff, uh, do when you come here to visit Antarctica. So this, uh, this is small uh, prose is called The Usefulness of Art. I had to translate it from Spanish, so please forgive me if some words sound a little bit odd. Diego didn't know the ocean. His father, Santiago, took him to discover it. They traveled south. There the ocean was waiting, behind the high hills. After a long walk, the boy and the father reached the sand dunes, and the ocean exploded 
before their eyes. And it was such immensity and brightness that the boy was speechless, speechless <laughs> with his beauty. And when the boy recovered his voice, trembling and stammering, begged his father, please help me to see. I hope the expedition staff has been able to help you see what we see in Antarctica. Thank you very much. What am I going to talk about? <laughs> Wales, Wales. Wales, maybe, huh? What a spectacular day. Uh, just quickly, we saw three species of whales and four species of seal today. Uh, just an extraordinary time today. Uh, I'll just speak about the whales quickly. This is the Mickey whale that was hanging out around the back of Half Moon, um, staying around in that channel, probably feeding. Um, he was there with me all day when I was out there on the point keeping me company. Uh, a wonderful thing to see. And then of course we have the fin whales. Um, this is what we would call a surface active group, or SAG. Um, so these, uh, this represents probably two males chasing a female um, who does not want to be chased. Um, their speed was extraordinary, going up to maybe 15, 16, 17 knots. Um, at one point, um, our ice pilot, uh, Captain Biane, uh, was really having a hard time keeping up with them. <laughs> So it was quite extraordinary to see that. Um, and then of course we have our humpback whale. Uh, there were several in the area, we managed to get a tail. Um, don't forget that we are looking for really good shots of tails. This is the shot that we have from our cameras, but if you've got a better tail, I want to see it. <laughs> Not going there. Um, what we will do is sometime later during this trip, uh, myself and Kirsty and Rachel will arrange uh, an afternoon in the observation lounge probably where we'll invite you to come up with your memory cards and we'll see what you have. And uh, um, Rachel has already christened this whale Oreo. So there you go, we saw Oreo the calf there, uh, also wonderful. Um, so a really, really, really good day for whales. Today though I'm going to answer a question that a lot of you had on the beach when we were down there by that whalebone. Just how old can whales grow? It's a really interesting question. It's one that we've only just recently been able to get really good inroads into as scientists. Um, there are four basic methods which I'm going to go through today. Uh, and they range from the kind of simple, almost like count the rings in a tree that you see here type method, uh, through to much more complex chemical methods as well. So. Some of you today are on the beach. Um, if, if you got to see me showing you the skull, you would, have, you would have seen how I was showing you the ear canal, which goes from the outside of the animal to the inner ear. Now, surprisingly, that ear canal is not functional. That's not how sound gets from the outside of the whale to the ear. So how does sound get from the outside of the whale to the ear? We don't know. It's one of these weird things we don't know. But the ear canal itself is completely blocked with wax. Mmm, earwax. <laughs> but it turns out that earwax is laid down in layers on a yearly basis. And so um, back in the olden days of whaling, if you wanted to age your whale, you could dissect your waxy plug and count the rings and get an estimate. Well, by doing that, we started to guess that whales might be, oh, I don't know, maybe 35 or 40 years old when we kill them. So, okay, that's a pretty old animal. The next method to come along was photo identification. Um, and I'm very proud to say I now work at the very college where an undergraduate student discovered that if you take a photograph of the underside of a whale tail, it was specific to that individual and it was a fingerprint. And if you manage to get it as a calf, like we did today, and then recite it and recite it and recite it every year, submitting new photographs, you can get the age of a whale. And that is an ongoing process, because we continue now to photograph whales that we had back in the 70s and the 60s. So the whales continue to get older. So for the photo identification method, we're now guessing humpbacks, for example, may last maybe 60 or 70 years. So the age estimate has gone up. A third method, which just happened in the last five years, is looking at types of human technology and dating them. So for example, this is a photo 
from the Inuit whale hunt of bowhead whales up in Alaska. A couple of years ago, a US uh, wildlife fishers officer was privileged enough to be invited on one of those hunts. So he was present when they cut up the whale and they discovered um, a harpoon in the animal. Now, that harpoon was not something like this, which dates back to, say, the 1900s. Um, it was actually much more aboriginal in nature. More like this guy, here. The last time that kind of technology had been used to kill a whale was over 100 years ago. So this whale that they killed had had a previous attempt at being whaled over 100 years ago, had survived, and then had gone on to finally be killed in around 2013 or so. So that whale was then dated at 130 years ago. And all the scientific community went, yeah, right. Maybe, maybe someone got out grandpa, grandpa's harpoon and tried to kill the whale. Since then, we have managed to date this with this method successfully at 130, 150, 170, and 213 years is the record right now for bowhead whales. Now that doesn't mean all whales grow to be that long, uh, oh, sorry, age that, uh, age that long, but still, it just shows the potential is there. And the reason that we don't have whales that old right now is simply because we killed them all. The whaling process tends to take out the larger animals, which are the older animals. So it's going to take another 50 or 60 years before we see those great, great, great grandmas and grandpas back in our ocean again, the really, really old animals. So this fact was out there for a couple of years, and finally someone figured out an even better way to do it, which involves looking at uh, amino acids in the eye after, the, uh, after, after death because amino acids decay in a particular way. The technique is called amino acid racematization. Um, it's a complicated technique, and it confirmed at that point that whales could be at least 100 years old. So we now know that we're working with animals that could be very, very old indeed. So then, if you look at a growth curve of these animals, so on the x-axis here we have um, age, and on the y-axis we have length, you can see how they grow fairly quickly when they're young, and then at around 50 to 75 years of age they stop growing, and this is our maximum data point here, that's our 213 year old whale. So they are extraordinarily long lived probably. So then how old was our whale that we saw today? This is a photograph I took on a slightly sunnier day at Half Moon, but of that very same whale jawbone that I got some of you to hug. I hope you can take those photos back with you. We now know that blue whales might grow up to be around 100 years old, maybe older. And we also know that this was a really big blue whale because that jawbone is absolutely huge. And there are ways to use the length of the jawbone to guess the length of the whale. And if we were to do that, it's about a 100-foot whale. This is one of the big mamas that we had back in, the, back in the 19th century. We also know that because of the site, that this whale was killed during the South Shetland shore whaling operations, which happened around about the turn of that century, around 1900, 1905, 1910. So, if you start putting those numbers together, to 2016, minus 110 years ago for the shore whaling, minus 100 years for the age of the whale, which is probably a conservative estimate, this whale was probably born somewhere around 1806, which means this whale was born at the same time as this guy. <laughs> and I'll just leave you with a sobering thought. I know as we get older, our memories are perhaps not as good as they are. But just think about what a blue whale that is 100 years old, what it might remember, especially if way back when it was young, it remembers the days of whaling. And now, as an old animal, it sees these giant ships coming towards it, seeing it, and just standing by passively and watching the glory of what they do. It's a really sobering thought. Thanks very much.
Thanks, Sean. Um, and thank you all for uh, all your questions and comments and uh, penguin calls <laughs> on shore, offshore, uh, in the hallways. They're getting better. It's nice. Um, thanks for coming to my talks today. I do have one more uh, penguin talk in a few days. It's called the Penguin Wrap-Up, which I will go over the species that we've seen. We're not done yet. We still have some Magellanic penguins up in uh, Punta Arenas, possibility of some Humboldt penguins in the waters up north of Punta. So, um, but half moon, half moon, we got it. We got the trifecta of the three penguins. I couldn't sleep until we got them. <laughs> and then today I slept for like four hours. <laughs> but yeah, we got them. And that is, you know, I'm a, there's a lot of lobbying going on from me to Iggy and everybody else down the line. It's like, chin straps, we're gonna get chin straps? Because I know you guys are all lobbying and I hear you. Yeah, like, where are we gonna, Adele's, Adele's? So I got it, we got it, and we got them. And so, oh, thank you. Chin straps, and uh, they were loud, weren't they? Yeah. They quiet down for about one second, and then some jerk in the distance starts going, and then the calling, and the whole thing goes off, and they start again, so. Is that, that it? Yeah, something like that. We saw eggs, they were all on eggs, no chicks yet. It's about 10, seven, eight, nine, ten days until the first chicks will hatch, but you certainly saw them showing the brood patch. We saw some predation by the skuas. We had kelp gulls running around, terns chasing the brown skuas. We had sheath bills running around. It was absolute mayhem. You saw the, the highway, the penguin highway. Did you notice how the penguins got out of your way? They were like, pass along, pass along, we're busy here, and they would stop and rest and, and take their um, snow for their, fresh, for their fresh water. But this is a shot this day last year. A lot more snow, right? So it was quite a difference. That pathway you walked up the hill there, um, just imagine all that snow last year. There's that long, big snow field over there, absolutely packed. And look at some of the penguins there nesting in the snow. But they know, somehow, that those pebbles are down underneath there. So they were occupying those sites, and when it melted out, they had their pebbles, and they were just fine. So it was all good there. A little bit of snow earlier last year. So just to show you the change possibility there in the seasons. This one here has got the pebbles, not down in there, but on the top. Do you see them bringing the pebbles? Yeah, so I'm at big rocks on it. You wonder why they have their flippers back. It's like, Jesus, heavy, that rock. And then did you notice that some of them were bringing the pebbles down to the beach? Yeah, I, I can't really explain that. Other than, you know, they're like, I gotta take this pebble somewhere. And then the youngsters are like down at the beach and you can see the ones passing them going, idiot, back up. He's like, really? So, the chicks look like this when they hatch out, so those of you who can stay on the next cruise, please do so. We'd love to have you. <laughs> Cute little things. They're a little gray and white. Uh, it dries out up there on Half Moon, kind of nice. And I just want to say that I've got another little penguin thing that's going to happen in a few days. But I wanted to show you this, and I'm glad to have time to do it. I was, uh, for some unknown god awful reason, I was down in Hope Bay in March, th March 30th, I think, of one year. That's when all the other ships are in like the Caribbean by then. But we stayed down a little bit later and uh, we were in a bit of a storm. That was in Hope Bay. That was in Hope Bay. We were just outside the Antarctic Sound and we were supposed to head north. And I don't know if you realize in March, it kind of gets dark as well. So there was ice blowing around. So we, anyway, we went back to Hope Bay and uh, for some shelter. And it was minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit, which is also minus 40 degrees centigrade. So I don't have to do the math. It was blowing a little bit, 50 miles an hour, for about 10 hours. And it was like, no problem, we're just gonna chuck into Hope Bay. So we did that. And if you looked on the radar, for the whole world, there was no pack ice around except, guess where? In Hope Bay. Oh, but that dampens the wave. So we went in there, and here's the pack ice that moved in. And then, when you hit minus 40 with a 40 knot wind, the ocean does this weird thing. It tries to freeze you in. So you see this, which looks like smoke right there, right? It is so cold 
that the ocean froze in front of our eyes. I'm not kidding you. It, this smoke, as it was, was the air was so cold that the moisture around the waves on the top started to get this ghostly sort of milky substance to it that was not in the water, but just above the water. It's like floating around. And I've heard about this, but it never happened. I don't want to see it again. It was dangerous. And so that all, that milky stuff is this cold smoke that you maybe hear about when the whalers, and then it started to congeal on the surface and it looked like, you know, jello, kind of uh, clear jello, and these little bitty pancake ice started to happen. And it's still blowing, and it's still cold, and it's still coming in. And then it started to grab onto the pack ice. Here's the wind still in the bottom. Some more pack ice out there. So the captain tried to go around by the glacier, exactly where our ship was. He tried to go around by the glacier. The pack ice came in. He went around to Hope Bay. And I said to my couple friends of mine, I said, well, at least they'll have good red wine for the winter. <laughs> there is a town there. And so then he, he had to just chunk it into the ice because we were going to get drifting you know, back into the bay. So he chunked it into the ice and it continued to freeze in front of us. Here came the pack ice. This is freezing right before our eyes. These photos were taken over a six hour period. Then it started to get the grease ice and the little pancakes over here, and some platelet ice over there. The pancakes start to come together, and then the seas start to calm down. Still very, very cold. Here's the ship coming in. We're just trying to hold it. We can try to go out this way, but we didn't. It came in too fast. These pancakes started to get really, really sharp on the top, and the platelets started to, to uh, sort of congeal and lay over each other, almost like shingles and tiles, and start to grasp together here just in a few hours and it started to bond, 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 really, really cold. And it did that right in front of us, taking pictures out of the bow. I had every piece of clothing on, <clears throat> and here's a little bit more pack ice came in, and this was the front of the ship on the Rhine that, that uh, was there on the side. The ship was so cold you couldn't sleep near the wall. It was really wild, I'm not kidding, you had to be, it was like painful to put your, hand against the inside of the outside of the ship. There were the portholes, we got down there and had a look. And uh, I did this talk uh, before and someone said, did you ever get out? <laughs> and I said, no, I'm still there. <laughs> this is what it looked like at night, everybody. Thanks to everybody, we'll talk about the penguins a little more later, thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Great to see you. Thank you for coming out, and I want to thank all of you for making this possible for me yet again. You've been thanking me. That's ridiculous. Thank you guys for bringing all of us and this whole team down here to do what we really like. Uh, tonight, I'm going to be talking to you during Liars Club. Not going to be telling the truth or lying, depending on how that works. Tomorrow, I'm going to give a lecture. Uh, the next day, I'll give a lecture on Ushuaia. But tonight, I actually want to talk to you about something that is pretty significant and important to us, and that is our experience down here in Antarctica and what we do now that we've been out of this experience that we're leading back and we're thinking about going home. And we've had a wonderful time down here. We've certainly got lots of education about the nature and the wonderful wildlife phenomenon. But I'm an anthropologist. You've been wondering what I've been doing down here this whole time, and I'm studying you. Uh, you are the people that come here, and I'm looking at human behavior. And so tonight I'm going to talk a little bit on what Iggy had mentioned, and I hope you'll stick around for it. It'll be about five, ten minutes, certainly hopefully worth it for you. Uh, I look at you, and I look at people, and I look at how people interact with the environment down here, and we're in a pristine environment that is used to not having a lot of people. And all of us have seen the negative effects of people coming down here and whaling, and what that has done to the habitat. We've seen that when we remove ourselves from doing those highly aggressive activities, that things start to come back, just as Sean Todd had mentioned earlier, very important. But the history of tourism, and tourism to Antarctica, is in constant debate about whether or not we should be doing it or should not be doing it. Just to give you an idea of numbers and the history before this beautiful quest came to Antarctica, you are now part of a wonderful tradition that actually goes back almost, in theory, almost 106 years old. 106 years ago, a little company called Thomas Cook decided that it was gonna launch the first ever commercial trip down to Antarctica. It was in 1910. They had a lot of good ideas, a lot of good marketing. It wasn't terribly expensive to come down here by today's money, but then it was, 
And then there was a little situation with an explorer that happened down here where he died, and that gave a lot of bad press to Antarctica. So Thomas Cook said, you know what, we're going to hold off on that. It wasn't for another 30 or so years before people attempted to come back down here for commercial means, and that was using ships from the Falklands, old delivery ships that would retrace routes and be what could possibly be our first official cruise tourism. Of course, Lindblad claims the actual first official sold to cruise down here sometime quite a bit later. But since then, things have changed. We can travel from all over the world to get to Antarctica in many different ways. You can fly over Antarctica, you can come by boat, you can cruise by, or you can do what we did, which is probably the best thing. Now, Antarctica is sold to just about anybody, and whether or not they actually make it to do an experience like us is a whole different story, and that gives us some cause for concern. Because sometimes we get little articles like this, and if you buy into this magazine and don't see a naked lady or a polar bear down here, you might be a little disappointed. This is a... Now, I'm an anthropologist, I'm from New Hampshire. This is something that we showed to third graders about Antarctic tourism. It's a little graph about how it's changed. So if we look at 1987, fewer than 100,000 people down here. 2007, that was actually the busiest year to date. Over 40,000 people visited Antarctica that season. That's pretty incredible. We get most of these statistics through this company, this organization, IOTO, that we talked about. We really have to play by their rules. And they do some of the best research on tourism in Antarctica that is out there. And they're gonna tell us that over the, the course of time, from 2009 to 2010, we go to 36,000 people, we dip down to 26,000 in 2011, and then uh, back up to 36,000. If anyone wants to see this in more detail later, you can. Seaborne tourism with landings, that doesn't mean seaborne. You'll note the spelling difference. With landings, 24,000, no landings, about uh, just under 10,000. Air and cruise, air and land, such as going over, and then the statistics for overflights, no landing, are zero, because Qantas refused to provide the information to Iana. <laughs> that happens sometimes. So this year, we're gonna do a 4.6% increase in 2015 to 16. That becomes quite interesting. Otto's just released that in next year, the, the, and the, the season goes 2016, 2017, is what we're in right now. So through the new year and into that point when rent comes down and gets locked in in March. And we're looking at the fact there's going to be 46,000 people, or sorry, 43,000, which is still less than that 46. That's a lot of people. So this is where your anthropologist starts to go to work. How many people is 46,000 people? 20,000 less than go to one single Patriots home game. Go Pats, or the exact number of people that can fit at Wrigley Field. Good job, Cubs. You see that? Happy for both those teams. But all of these people, which is a lot, 46,000 people seem like a lot, but not when you put them into a stadium, or when you put them right over here. This is where all of those folks go. And so I ought to just distributed this recently, which is even more helpful. That 75% of these tourists go to a space only one-sixth the side of Heathrow Airport. So actually, when we look at how big Antarctica is, it means that we're only treading in a very small area, which also has some repercussions. Because how we act, how we behave when we're here, certainly can affect it negatively, which is why we go to all of the trouble to do everything that we do here to help preserve this environment. Just as a breakdown sort of for where the people come from, because you're probably interested a little bit, the United States of America leads, then Australia, China, UK, Germany, Canada, pretty much like we have on board, an interesting sampling. Well, what happens when we see those people? What I noticed as an anthropologist was we all got a little possessive we all saw these boats out there, this is from the other night, and we said, oh, what are they doing here? And I heard someone say, don't worry, hon, that's not as fancy as this trip, to which the wife responded, oh, good, and then walked away. I thought that was quite nice, and if you are that person right now, good, good job, I'm with you right there. But there's cause for debate. Nyato, which promotes this, says there actually isn't more than a minor impact on the environment down here through tourism. And that is exactly what a tourism outfit would say. I think that actually there are many positive benefits to all of us being out here because we become ambassadors for this great continent and we go home and tell the rest of the world about it. But there's a lot of debate with a lot of folks that have never been here. 
about this. In fact, there are a number of people, I read this on Al Gore's internet today, there are a number of people that actually believe that every Antarctic landing has been faked. So, I don't know what the heck happened uh, with us down here. Maybe that Uruguayan vibe is still going on. But so this debate back in 2003, is the rise in, in tourism helping or hurting? I think it's helping but it has to have a limit on it. We go on to different debates. How can we have sustainable tourism to Antarctica? We can do it the way that we're doing here on Seaborn. If I didn't think Seaborn was doing a good job with this, I sure as heck wouldn't be here, and I wouldn't keep telling people to do so. This is probably the best way to do it. But then the debate comes, should tourists be banned from Antarctica? This was January of last year, of 2015, that this happened. So I did a little research last year. I interviewed 30 couples on each of the trips, and I found out that your average seaborne guest believes that the number of tourists to Antarctica should absolutely lower next year after they've been on board. <laughs> so, yeah. go figure. What we have to do in this is keep in mind the importance of sustainability and the importance of having a very, very light, almost insignificant, <coughs> oh, minuscule footprint when we're down here. What we do when we push you into the water and you wipe off your boots, we clean you when you come back on board, all the staff that goes over and says, don't walk here, walk here, that's because we have to protect this place. So all of you get a wonderful sticker, a little, a little a teddy bear, whatever you want for a sticker, for following these rules here. But the funny thing is, as soon as you leave here, you don't necessarily follow all those rules everywhere that you go. We did it for six days, seven days. That means we can do it when we visit Rome. That means we can look at our effect on our environments, not only natural, but also urban. And when we go back home, we scream as loud as we can about protecting this and other environments out there so that we can continue to see them, learn from them, and those 100-year-old whales can say, wow, you guys are really doing a good job, not just here, but everywhere. There is a slightly negative effect to the tourism that's a silent, uh, effect out here that we don't necessarily see when we're in Antarctica, and that's the effect of the communities after we've been here. It's great that all these ships come down and don't pollute, but eventually the stuff has to go somewhere else. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about this and the huge number of visitors that go to Ushuaia each year and how that has an effect. So what can you do? When you go home, you can continue singing from the hills. You can organize your friends to come over. You can show them a few of your pictures from Antarctica. If you show them 9,423 pictures of penguins, these guys are going to want to obliterate this place just to spite you. But it's good. You can educate. If you want to do something cool, take a dozen of your photographs, blow them up, have them printed, and donate them to a library. Ask any of the expedition team for a reading list. Ask for ours and donate those books to libraries. Put them in places where people wouldn't think about this spot. And that's what you can do. You can have an art sale. You can do pretty much anything. We're all available for ideas for that. I'll tell you what, there was one in particular organization that probably made the biggest impact. In 2013, a group of 13 to 15 year old boys was incredibly inspired to preserve Antarctica forever. And that, I don't know how they managed to have that marketing campaign be so effective, but it worked. It even worked for some of us, you know, approaching 40. We said, let's keep this place good. But when you go home, talk about the penguins, talk about the seals, talk about the ice, talk about everything you know, without necessarily beating the eco drum, let people know about your experiences here, and that you are part of the preservation, but you can do that elsewhere too. We handled most of that for you, and it's up to you to wave that flag and to continue sailing around the world in a responsible manner. It doesn't mean that you can't relax and have a couple beers when you're out there, but certainly remember these lessons so that we don't end up just as one lonely penguin floating on an iceberg. Thank you very much. We'll see you tonight at Lyra's Club.